Hey everyone, welcome back. For today, we are talking about algorithmic concepts called recursion, and we are using that to solve day nine recursion. So the tactic of recursion is implementing a function where the function solution relies on smaller subproblem solutions. So for example, factorial. Factorial of three is really the result of three multiplied by the smaller subproblem of factorial of two, and so on and so forth. So in this case, it makes sense that we can use recursion to solve factorial in this case. For this question, we are supposed to implement the factorial function and we are, and we are supposed to use recursion in this case. So the function on line 16 and line 17 will take in an integer and it will return another integer, which is the factorial of n. So in this case, the input is a single number, which represents n. And we are supposed to use this to give back the factor of 3, which is 6. So let's get into it. In this question, we do not have to deal with the input because HackerRank has already kindly provided us that. So for this function, we can focus on just line 16 and line 17. So to make it clearer, I will let the function signature of factorial take in an integer and return back an integer. So in this case, for every single recursive implementation, that typically needs to be a termination state. We do not want the factorial function or any recursive function to continue calling itself without actually stop calling itself. And we want this result of the recursive function to eventually return something to the function that called it previously. So for example, if we call factorial of 3, Factorial of 3 will return 3 multiplied by factorial of 2. Factorial of 2 will be invoked, and factorial of 2 will return the result as 2 multiplied by factorial of 1. And when we invoke factorial of 1, we want factorial of 1 to return back 1. Factorial of 1 is 1. So the termination state in this case would be if n is equal to 1, we want the function to return back 1 so that if factor of 2 calls factor of 1, it will get back 1 and it will be able to return 2. 2 multiplied by 1 is 2. So that's pretty much the implementation for factorial. So let's first write out the termination state. If n is equal to 1, we will return 1. Else, we can reduce this factorial problem by returning n multiplied by the smaller subproblem n minus 1. And that's pretty much it for this implementation. It is a good time to talk about time and space complexity because in this case, we are starting to deal with functions and in this case, we will want to explain to maybe your colleagues or a technical interviewer on what is, on how the worst case runtime and memory usage for your algorithm scales with respect to an input. So in this case, the input is n and your technical interviewer or your colleagues might ask you, hey, what is the worst case runtime and space usage of your algorithm? And we usually use two concepts, runtime complexity and space complexity. So in this case, if we take n, big N, as the input n over here, in this case, this factorial function's runtime, worst case runtime, will scale linearly with n. And that's because if you call factor of 10, factor of 10 will call factor of 9, factor of 9 will call factor of 8, so on and so forth, until factor of 1. There are 10 function invocations over here, and in every function invocation, we are doing some computation. So you can see that the amount of computations we need will scale linearly as we increase n. Similarly for space, under the hood where we invoke a function like this, Python would have to keep track of the previous function's memory state in something called a call stack. So in every single process, in this case, if you run a Python script, it spins up a process. A process has its own memory and it manages whatever that is necessary to run this program. So in this case, as you call factor of 10 and factor of 10 calls factor of nine, the memory of factor of 10 in keeping track of all the variables, all the global local variables, the state, the variables, the inputs to this function will be stored on the call stack. So factor of 10 will be on this call stack and it invokes factor of 9. Now factor of 9 will be on the call stack 
and factor of 10 is still there because the function has not completed yet. Factor of 10 is still pending the result of factor of 9 before it can return this result. So factor of 10 and all the information regarding factor of 10 is still on this call stack. Similarly, factor of 9 will call factor of 8 and its memory used for keeping track of its variables and waiting for factor of 8 will be on this call stack, so on and so forth. And because all of these functions cannot be terminated until its child until its child evocation of factorial is completed, you will be using memory linear that scales linearly to the input n over here. And because of that, the time and space complexity for this recursive implementation is really O n and space will be O n as well because of this behavior of recursion. So that's pretty much it for this uh, implementation of recursive factorial. Let's run this against the test cases. And yeah, this implementation works. So for the sake of learning, it's not asked by this question, but let's try implementing factorial using an iterative approach. And I'll explain why in typical scenarios we will want to use an iterative factorial instead of a recursive factorial. So if you're doing an iterative factorial, I'm pretty sure at this point, after practicing the previous days of code on iteration and stuff using for loops, I'm pretty sure is, that is a very easy way to do this using a for loop. So what I would do is define a variable that would be multiplied with all values from 1 to n and put this inside the accumulator. So for i in range 1 to n plus 1, we will set accumulator to be equal to the product of itself together with that number and we will just return the accumulator. So let's use this accumulator function to run the factorial instead. And it works. take some time to run the test cases for some reason. But it's okay, let's just wait. Okay, so this iterative implementation works as well. And in this case, the time complexity, the worst case runtime it, it might use will be on as well. And that's because if you increase n, the amount of computation that you do on line 33 will scale linearly as well because the for loop will just scale linearly. And for the space complexity in this case, this, we are using a constant number of variables over here. We are using accumulator and we are only using constant memory over here for this for loop to, us, to be assigned to i as well. So in this case, the space complexity that you use is really constant, unlike the recursive function. So you do not use as much RAM if you use the iterative factorial over here. So that's the benefit of an iterative implementation. You save on space. There's no need for you to have additional memory used on the call stack just to keep track of the previous evocations of factorial as you wait, as these factorials wait for their child factorial evocations to finish. So that's pretty much it for this question. I hope you learned something. I hope that this was of value to you. And if you feel that it was, please give us a like and subscribe. And we will see you in the next video.